Hi, I'm Jonathan Fields, and this is Good Life Project. So my guest today is Jake Bronstein, who's the CEO and founder of a really fascinating apparel company called Flint and Tinder. The way he's going about building it and the mission that's built into it is pretty awesome. So we're going to really deep dive into that. So awesome to be hanging out with you here today. Yeah, likewise. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So um, before we get to that, um, you have kind of a fascinating journey. We spent a little bit of time on the phone a couple of weeks ago chatting about it. But, sure. um, but before we even get to that, there's something that happened in our first phone conversation that I, I've shared with you. It's the first time anyone's ever sort of like done that with me, which is that I was talking to you. I wanted to know a lot more about you. And I said, yeah, I'd love to have you as a guest on the show. And you're like, it sounds great. I'd love to do it. But <laughs> before I say yes. Well, you're, you've, you've already like you've, you've cheated it into more of a story because it, right. wasn't, it wasn't like you had to answer the question as like a requisite. I just, right. We were talking and I, and I had a question, period. It, it, like the, the two weren't fully related. But I think, uh, you know, you had said that you study happiness a lot or, or had, you know, right. had been doing the study of happiness. And uh, I've read of the study of happiness and I've, I've spent a lot of time with uh, Tony Shea talking happiness. And somewhere in and around there, I, I started almost obsessing for, for not always, but just for like the two week period you know, during which you called yeah. <laughs> with this idea of like, if, if my palate is, uh, well, I guess, I guess what I was wondering was like Richard Branson, who's, who's a guy that I admire, he must eat better than I do. He must eat better <laughs> foods on a regular basis. You know, he must eat in the finest restaurants. He must taste things that I'll never taste and a variety and this and that. But is he happier as a result of it or has he set himself up to be less happy because, you know, when he's running through an airport, maybe he doesn't appreciate a burger the way that I do. Mm -hmm. um, and so, right. So I, I sort of wanted your take on it. And the interesting thing is I had been asking this question for about a week in some different ways. And you were the first person to distill it down to such a clear and obvious question that I, yeah. I like... Uh, you said, well, what you're asking is, is it better to have loved and lost? And and the minute that you said that, I thought, oh, right, I, I guess that is what I'm asking. And and now that we have it down to like a manageable bite-sized <laughs> chunk, right. because I didn't even know how to really express this question, I guess the answer is, yeah, it's like, it's pretty obvious. Sure. Right. Yeah, of course. No, but I, I loved it because we were having this conversation. I was asking you a lot of questions. You were sharing stuff. And, um, and I love it because it was first, one of, one of the, you know, we've done a lot of these, these shows now and spoken to a lot of just incredible people who've achieved a lot. And one of the commonalities that I have found with a number of them is an almost insane level of curiosity. See, there's something, even when you just said that, I wanted to know, well, who's the most interesting? I mean, just like, <laughs> just, because you're, so you're like, like oh, manifesting, wow, right. to some very fascinating people, well, who? Get like, give me, give me a list. What's the best one? When, when I go home and I, and I pick just one interview, <laughs> what's the one that I should look at for sure? Right. So yeah. I'll leave you hanging on that. But All right. Okay. I don't want to pick and choose favorites, but, but there has been this amazing thing. And it didn't actually dawn, actually, the interview that we did where I, I really started to connect the dots was when we interviewed Dan Ariely, who's a kind of legendary behavioral psychologist and professor and um, uh, behavioral economist, actually. And... Um, when we, when we actually stopped filming, we got off the air and one of the guys who was filming with us that day had, had ink all over his body and a lot of tattoos. And um, Dan's a crazy busy guy. He was going to like five countries and three shows before he left New York after us. But he kind of stopped and he was like, look at this guy, look at his arm. And he walks over and he's like, so explain this to me. And he wants to know the story of this tattoo. And he's like, roll up your sleeve. And he wants to see the whole thing. And he's like, is there more? And, and he was just so genuinely curious yeah. about human nature and about what the story was on this guy's arm. You know, and it kind of cued me into this thing and I just and maybe it just made me start to look for it right. in other people. And then you start to see yeah. that there's, there's so maybe so many of the people that I'm drawn to or so many of the people that tend to go out into the world and do a lot of things, there's this insane curiosity. Yeah, I, I, I would imagine that it has something to do also with luck and that mm. you know, the people that you're drawn to are people who would be perceived as being lucky, right? They've like, they've achieved 
what they've achieved, they've gotten to where they've gotten to, but so much of luck is is in setting yourself up for it and then, you know, looking for right. opportunities and moments and and mm. things, you know. Yeah. So let's jump back to your story. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, you're kind of riding this really fascinating adventure right now, but you've had this kind of crazy, fascinating whirlwind journey um, in the world of, of publishing and entrepreneurship. So take me back. Like all the way back? Do, well, you, you, not you to when a, you were five. All right, okay, all right. <laughs> um, well, so, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna do the same thing that we did even when we yeah. talked. I'm gonna connect dots that aren't fully connected, actually. Cool. and I'll but, stop you along the way. <laughs> all right, okay, all right. So, um, going in the way back machine, I was, I was, uh, I was getting ready to graduate high school and I didn't want to go to college and this greatly upset my mother and uh, somewhere along the line we ended up with this deal where they they wanted me to leave the house that was very important if I wasn't gonna go to school I couldn't live at home I had to learn how hard the world was Mm. Uh, but if I was gonna go to school they would give me like five hundred dollars a month for you know bills and things so Step one was figuring out what was the minimum acceptable level of school. <laughs> and so I think straight out of high school, I tried to become an EMT, which was like a, a one night a week and a one day a week class, but it got me my $500. Right. And so I, I moved out and I was pretty near uh, self-sufficient, uh, you know, not being self-sufficient because right. I, I was getting this money. Um, and toward the end of that phase, I, I I think I knew, I probably even knew from the start that I didn't want to be an EMT. That this was just like, it was like a, a you know, it was like taking a painting class. Like, oh, that'll be fun to learn. Right. But I, I don't know. And it really gets your know. minimum requirement. And it, kept, and it got my minimum requirement. Um, but somehow through that and through some random, you know, interactions and things, uh, I ended up being one of the first, I, I ended up being on a show called Road Rules, MTV's Road Rules, which was a really early reality show. So at the, at the time there had been Real World and then Road Rules was a spinoff of it, but reality TV wasn't a thing. Nah. So here I was at uh, 18 turning 19 and I was like on a reality show and then I came off that and it was really confusing because people didn't know if you were a celebrity or if you were rich right. or like what you were doing anywhere you were. And, and this was, Road Rules was basically when there was like a group of people thrown in like an RV or in something an RV. like that. Yeah. And you driving to all these different... Yeah, you would do like different missions, but they, they also hadn't figured out what would now be like some very basic television conceits. Like that if you don't accomplish these missions, you know, there has to be a punishment. Maybe somebody gets voted off. So that, right. that like wasn't a thing. We were just driving around uh, getting prizes, I guess, some, <laughs> somehow. It was, it was confusing. Um, but from there, I ended up uh, temping when I got to New York City, and and I met a guy, and he was uh, he was an executive at Playboy, who had had about seven. I mean, I'm I'm really taking you on the rambling. No, it's good. Now. All right, okay. <laughs> so he had had seven assistants before me. Each one, these beautiful women, uh, or he had probably had more than seven assistants because he had been married seven times. I think was the oh thing. Oh my god. And he would often marry his assistants, and I was hired in his absence. And so he came back, and there was this like awkward, uh, you know, nineteen-year-old kid sitting at the desk, and he he did not like that, and I didn't like that he didn't like that. But he began a campaign of trying to get me to quit. I think mm. uh, that at times involved I had to buy a mustache wax, and we together I combed his mustache. One day it was it was a weird <laughs> it was a weird place in time, but. Uh, but one day I did a thing right, and in a moment of like kind of, you know, liking me or something, he said, "What are you doing here? Like, why why are you here? You, you know, what what's going on?" And he had had a subscription to a British magazine called FHM, and I I hadn't ever looked at it actually. It came bound in plastic, and I wouldn't dare open his magazines. Mm. But I saw this as an opportunity to really build a relationship, so I said. You know, I've always been a fan of FHM magazine, and I and I and I want to write for FHM magazine. That's been my life goal. But I called them, and it turns out they don't take American writers. It was a British magazine, it's a large format thing. Mm-hmm. And he said, uh, "Are you like you're fucking with me? Somebody put you up to this? Like, how did you get here? What did you do?" 
And I had no idea what was going on, but it turned out he was a very powerful publishing executive who was, he was at Playboy, but he also consulted for two other publishing giants and had just orchestrated the purchase of an American company for a billion dollars just to launch FHM Magazine. Oh, no kidding. And so he picked up the phone and he called a guy in England and he said, there's a really smart kid sitting across from me who says his only dream is to write for FHM Magazine. Like, <laughs> what are you going to do about it? And, and the guy uh, said, well, we've just hired the editor-in-chief, so he's going to have to meet him. So he said, great, when, when are the three of you going to dinner? And before I knew it, I was there, I was the very first hire uh, of this British magazine that was launching in America. No kidding. And so at 21 years old, I, I, they didn't even know what titles were. So, you know, like what the masthead should look like. So this guy said, you know, and like, what position do you think you'd be? And I said, uh, well, I'd be an associate editor. Which sounded good to me. And that's sort of like middle management. Yeah. It's not really where I belonged. And so after he realized that, because I was the first hire, actually, the whole rest of the magazine had to be hired around the fact that at 21 I was associate editor. So they're like, if you look at the early issues of this magazine, everybody's like the senior this and right, that right, right. because they all kind of had to be above me. Just making up different titles and yeah. stuff. Yeah. But, uh, but it was a small team and we launched this magazine called FHM and it was pretty successful. Uh, I think we like got to a million issues a month in under a year. Uh, but um, So at this point, yeah. what's, what's driving you? Because you come out, you literally, you come off of like an RV, yeah. being, having your life filmed twenty four seven. Yeah, you you end up which was temping. confusing. Like that wasn't that wasn't my thing. I didn't really know what my thing was, and FHM felt like my thing. It, it was actually, uh, it was I got to write these experiential pieces, right? Mm -hmm. Like if I saw something that interested me, I got to pitch it at a meeting. I got to go out and like do a thing. You know, I spent a week with Dog the Bounty Hunter before anybody knew who he was <laughs> no in kidding. Denver. Uh, he cried. I held him. It was like, you know, and I I went to uh, Mardi Gras with Joe Francis and, and Snoop Dogg. Uh, and uh, Joe Francis, the Girls Gone Wild guy. Yeah. And uh, I don't know what other interesting things, but it was the whole thing was really it was it was great. I was 21. I got to I got to cast the girls next door for the magazine, you know. Girls from all over would send me pictures of themselves in bikinis. We'd have castings. Uh, I got to go to photo shoots and say things like, you know, I, if only she was glistening. Like, can we wet her? Stuff like that. Oh, God. Um, so it was neat. It was also like, it was a neat moment in culture. Because I, I think that stuff, Lad Magazines, which was, it was an aspirational magazine where instead of aspiring to be a better man, you mm. were aspiring to college. And I, I actually didn't go to college, so I was like living my college experience through the magazine. Through the magazine, yeah. It was it was a really great and interesting time. And I I think in hindsight, when I when I tell a story and I like to connect the dots, right? Uh, what I tell people that I learned and and what what I was really doing there was learning to build audiences around ideas. I mean that mm. that's like how I sell that as like a marketable skill because a few years later magazines started to fall apart and and most people that I worked with uh, myself included like kind of didn't know what was next mm -hmm. because we were all scraping for magazine jobs but magazines were folding right um, and so you kind of had to pitch yourself as being internet ready some kind of way and so yeah so that that's how I did it um, and so and when yeah. you're at FHM also I mean you're doing a lot of writing there yes and there, it, there were five of us and yeah, we're all writer editors. Right, and it sounds like also you've got this fascination with just the human condition, with human nature. I think so. I mean, I think like I hadn't, I hadn't started when you called me about a year before I started thinking a lot about happiness. Because mm. if if you if you dig deep enough into your motivation, you know, on anything, eventually, if you keep asking why, the answer is always because I think it'll make me happy. Yeah. I mean, that's like always I mean, where it lands. Fundamentally, yeah. Um, but at that time, I think it was like more guttural. I was just, I was happy all day, every day. It was, mm. it was, it was really amazing. And I don't know if, if I, I wonder if I could ever honestly be that way again. I, I mm. think in your early twenties, you can be, uh, not self-aware enough to just like enjoy a thing mm. and maybe like getting into your thirties where I am now, you're like. 
Like, why do I like this? What, what does it say about me? Do other people like this thing? What is it? I mean, there's just like so much thought that yeah. you're maybe overanalyzing. Um, there, there, there's, a, there's a classic Buddhist parable, actually, where uh, you know, like a thousand Buddhist monks are gathered to receive the teaching from the teacher up on high. And the teacher takes a, a flower and just holds it up. And 999 Buddhist monks just sit there like, what does it mean? What, how do we interpret it? What's the lesson? And one, you know, like way back, some young one, you know, just sitting in the back, just looking and smiling. And the teacher says, that, you know, he's the one who gets it. Because he's not trying to figure out. Yeah. He's just experiencing yeah. it. He's just, he's, he's like, it's just joy. Yeah. It's like taking it back to that food question earlier. Yeah. I'll, uh, I was in Vegas recently and I was looking down at the Hard Rock Casino's pool from my hotel room and I was like terrified. I could not <laughs> walk through the lobby, but I wished that I could. Like I, I, I was staring at and, and I've never been one to dance with my hands in the air or mm -hmm. just go like, what? Like that. But it looks like fun. P people who can do that seem to be really like, like they're, they're certainly in the moment. You know, right. Um, but so uh, somehow FHM led to some weird internet stuff, led to some weird marketing stuff, uh, where I was consulting for ad agencies who were selling these ideas to Fortune 500 companies. Mm -hmm. um, and somewhere in there, I thought what would be really smart was if I could get my own clients. And so I found a guy who owned a bottled water company called Tapped NY, which was. Um, New York City tap water in a bottle, <laughs> essentially. And I talked him into letting me be his marketing consultant. And we launched a marketing campaign for like no money. And it got national press like inside of a week. It was in Dateline. It was referenced in SNL. It was everywhere. Uh, it didn't actually sell any bottled water. And, and I don't know, like the bottled water wasn't even hardly on shelves for it to sell. Uh -huh. I, I didn't know at the time that actually it was only on four shelves in Manhattan. Um, but one day, he, this guy called me into his office and he, was, he, said, uh, he, he said, I think I'm going to close this company down. I don't, I don't know if this is going to work. But uh, I found these magnets. And do you think that you could sell them to readers of your blog? I was keeping a blog that was about fun and it was for adults uh, with my point being that that this blog would somehow uh, help people remember to have fun in the workplace. It was updated mm. eight times a day with something fun to look at or Wait, a fun game. Eight to times play. a day? Yeah. By you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was crazy. And like I would go on family vacations and get up at six in the morning and walk through the darkness to wherever there was internet to right. try to. And I, I, I mean, I, I was so serious about it. If, if like if I couldn't push publish at the right time, I'd call a friend, I'd give them the log, and I was like, ah, oh, you gotta, you know, people are waiting for this. There weren't right. really people waiting and for it. And that's happiness. <laughs> yeah, right. And that was, that was my pursuit of happiness. Right. But, uh, but so he had this idea for magnets and asked if we could sell them to the readers of my blog, and we each put $1,000 into it, and that became Buckyballs, which was a, a product that he was really in charge of the manufacture of and ran the company, and I was sort of marketing, branding. Uh, and stuff like that, but we put it in close to 10,000 stores mm -hmm. uh, and sold it in 12 countries and I think did like $50 million in sales. And this was the, the, the failed water guy, he basically. This was the failed water guy, right. and it was with no additional investment. It was our $2,000 scaled into all of that. Um, so and 2,000 to 50 million. Yeah, I mean, it, it was a, a really crazy uh, ride, and it gets crazier, actually, if you, if you Google it. Uh, yeah. It ended up, uh, we, the consumer safety decided that they were unsafe for children. We were never selling them to children. It had six warnings on the box. It was sold in places like, you know, Brookstone, not Toys R Us, but uh, they first worked with us around safety and then they decided that we needed a recall. And then when the negotiation, really a recall, is, it's typically a voluntary recall. Mm. I guess I'd already left the company by this point, but the the day-to-day -day operations anyway. The negotiation, uh, it, it's there's normally like a long period where, where you work out how this all should work with them. Uh, they sort of jumped that phase and did some weird stuff where they essentially tried to put the company out of business very quickly. And, and it was in violation of their own procedures. 
So then the head of the CPSC had to answer to Congress for like, <laughs> I mean, it, it's so just it crazy. It's all mind boggling. Big political mess. Yeah, I mean, it, it's really, a, it, it was sort of a political thing. Um, but about a year before that, I had actually left. And, and the reason why was I was watching uh, the manufacturing base to produce this product mm. in Asia get very large. And the U.S. operations were very small because we were just sort of a marketing and sales office. Right. Um, and I started wondering if there wasn't a way to do something in inverse of that because of what was going on with the economy. Mm -hmm. It'd be really nice to you know employ hundreds of American workers. Right. So this was when was this around like 2008ish? Or? This was well, I left Bucky in 2010. Oh, okay. Uh, no, 2011. And then by 2012 was when I started having the answer, mm. where I go, I think I know what I can do here. Um, what was the drive, though, to make, I mean, so you saw this, okay, you know, like most of the production is in Asia and a little bit of the marketing is here. I want yeah. to reverse that. Why? Um, well, I mean, the, the why was because I wanted to have like a positive economic impact, right? With, with so many people losing their jobs and, mm. and so much talk about manufacturing leaving. Uh, I wanted to contribute to our manufacturing, you know, I, I wanted to create jobs. Nice. And, but Bucky and products like Bucky, of which, you know, your house is filled, really can't be made in America and shouldn't be made in America. And, mm. you know, when we get to the place where our labor pool uh, charges a lower rate than Asia to, to make junk uh, or to make stuff, uh, it, you should probably move to Canada. Like mm. you know, it, it, we're we're not winning right. by the by the standards that you want to win. Uh, so I wanted to make something here that should be made here and that could be made here. And what I thought would be a real and I and I'd always wanted to be in clothing. I thought I thought having an apparel company like being Ralph Lauren mm -hmm. must be pretty cool. You get to like paint a whole lifestyle picture for people. Uh, but I didn't want to have to hire a designer and and back their like product vision. So I was sort of looking for an opening that would allow all of this. And I thought that bed sheets was the answer. <laughs> so I, I wanted to make bed sheets and I wanted to put a man's name on them because I was walking through Bed Bath & Beyond and half the bed sheets had a woman's name on it and the other half had the word hotel, which was meant to represent quality or yeah, quality, luxury, that kind of stuff. Right. But I thought, you know, if you're like a college guy or maybe you've just got your first apartment, how would you know what bed sheets for you? They must all go to hotel. But if, <laughs> if there was like, a, you know, another sheet somewhere in the middle, even if it looked the same, but it was like called, you know, Max Wellington bed right. sheets or whatever it was, you'd go, ah, oh, that must be for me. So I wanted to make a bed sheet and I thought, great, this will be the start of my apparel company and I'll do it in America because the, the labor to cost ratio is such that you should be able to do that here. So for apparel, it's something where it actually works. For some some things in apparel. So right. it certainly should work with a bed sheet because okay. a machine will spit out fabric and then you know you you're gonna fold over the edges and sew it down and like sell the whole kit for a hundred dollars. Right. I mean so, so there's like a huge margin there. In theory. And and low labor. That's right. what it is. It's it's the Got low it. labor. So the, the material costs it might cost fifty dollars to make the sheets. Right. But it's that the labor itself is minimal enough that we should be able to do it here. It turns out though, you cannot make bed sheets in America. You you certainly can't make high thread count bed sheets in America. Mm. The equipment no longer exists in this country and likely the institutional knowledge to run that equipment uh, really isn't here anymore. And that was shocking to me that there are just things that mm. like that ship has sailed and so now but isn't it so bizarre to think that there's something that you literally cannot make in this yeah, country it, it's like done it's 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 such a foreign notion it's yeah. over yeah be, and and it's and it's a little bit upsetting i mean it, it or yeah i think i think it it was stunning to me it was the first time that i'd ever considered that no nah. i mean because it wouldn't occur to me i mean i basically like anything that could be made maybe maybe cost too much but the concept but that it just, it just but, can't be right, done. But like that it's simply, it's not an option. Right. On the menu, it doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Uh, you can buy imported high thread count bed sheets or right. you cannot have bed sheets right. like that, period. There's like, there's no middle ground. Uh, and, it, and that was upsetting and confusing. But as part of 
trying to find somewhere that could make these bed sheets, what I had found was a number of t-shirt factories. It's, it's really what the American apparel industry is geared for right now is making t-shirts. Mm. It's like a, it's cut and sew, knit goods, and really t-shirts. Um, and I thought, geez, you know, if you made underwear, I, I, and, oh, and, and they're all shedding jobs, all of these factories. I mean, mm-hmm. our, our first factory closed down and, and, and that was upsetting too. But so I, I thought they should be able to make underwear. And, and it took about another six months to convince anybody to attempt it. Uh, I kept saying that all, you know, it's just like a t-shirt. It has the same materials, the same number of holes. We just need to put elastic on one. And that's a really naive, really, really naive way of going about it. But right. without that naivete, it wouldn't have happened at all. Yeah. And so what's so interesting to me yeah. about you've gone from like industry to industry to industry to industry in a seeming fearless way. I mean, you know, I when I think about it, actually, so... This last jump was the time that I worried most about where I was going to land. Huh. When I when I left Bucky and didn't know what I was going to do with myself. And I think the reason why was because at every other time that there had been a switch, I had no fallback. There was there was like figure something out or don't eat. Mm. Period. And and when you hear you know that's not that unique a story uh, but it it certainly fosters like movement, you know, and right. and uh, I don't know if you watch behind the music, mm-hmm. they all have that moment. They're all like, "This had to work." I, you know, it was like my third album that I was making. Somebody had to buy it somewhere. Right. Uh, but the truth is, if that album didn't work for them, they were going to make another album because the other option is don't eat. Right. So, so after Bucky though was the was the first time where that kind of wasn't the case. You know, I had. Uh, about a year and a half's worth of money in the bank, right? Mm. And I could watch TV uh, and then be in that don't eat situation. But so I was scared about like, what's that going to mean? And am I going to be motivated? And I think uh, the bed sheets thing I pursued because there was an opportunity, I thought. And when I, when I started seeing the problem, that problem really became a motivator, actually, because mm. I, was, I was pretty upset about it. So, I mean, which kind of gets to where you know the question in my head, which is that as you go from here to here, here clearly you're good at you're a good entrepreneur, you're good at figuring things out. Um, but what's what's the thing that is there a unifying thing that's pulling you? Like, is there, a, or is it really just you see a problem? I mean, I don't know. You know, the when when we were talking, I I, I can I can fake connect the dots in reverse. Yeah, right. But anyone can curve fit like that. So. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think though, I know, I know what excites me more than anything in the world, is, is uh, or at least at this phase of my life, sure. it's, so brands don't actually live with the brand. It lives everywhere else. I mean, like Coca-Cola uh, doesn't mean what Coke wants it to mean. It means what you want it to mean mm. because, because it's, it's your vision of those attributes that create a brand. Right. Everything else is just signage. Um, and when you, when you're able to paint a picture and have other people actually see it the way that you hoped, it's a really exciting moment for me. I mean, mm. I, I, I haven't gotten to the place with Flint and Tinder where I, I which is the name of the, the right. now underwear and other stuff company, but, uh, where I've heard somebody talking about it with no relation to any, like, just like heard it, which you know, out of the corner of my ear and realize that they're saying everything that I would want them to see mm. in it. But like, but that is the, that to me is just the epitome of amazingness. Mm. You know, that you've been able to, to create this world for somebody. Yeah, I mean, that's, I, I kind of, I love and I'm obsessed with stuff like that also. Because um, like, I'm looking at what you're doing and I'm like, okay, you can't have a mad passion for bed sheets. You know, you can't have a mad passion, but there's clearly this this other thing yeah. that's pulling you. I mean, and and there's uh, and maybe you did have a mad passion, but I didn't sense that that <laughs> I didn't was, really have was a mad it. Passion yeah, for it's like, I must have bed sheets. No, um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think I I like making brands, and really, what I like about making brands is that it it's like it's it's this thing about 
sharing a story with somebody and that it, it's really in their perception of it that mm -hmm. it exists. Um, so, you know, I like with, with Flint and Tinder, so we, we basically we overhauled t shirt, a t shirt factory mm -hmm. is how it started, right? We bought them the equipment, we taught them, well, we, we didn't teach them, we worked with them, we taught each other right. how to hold ourselves to a higher tolerance than than happens in a t-shirt factory to achieve what's required for underwear uh, and, and how to do it effectively. Um, but uh, I forgot what I was saying. So, I mean, yeah. you were building the underwear and you kind yeah. of like, so at this point, and you're, you're basically refitting the whole factory yeah. and teaching people how to do it right. Um, but I'm also assuming that you don't have any deep love of underwear. Well, I'm sure you yeah, you, know, you like to wear. <laughs> at this point, I mean, I, I, at this point though, I must be more obsessed with it. Than, I mean, I keep a journal. I every every pair of underwear that enters my house gets numbered, and then I keep a journal about like how many times it's been washed, what the thought was every day, what, uh -huh. like it just all. You know, we 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 track it in my house across some different metrics, and I like I'm upset now when my wife does the laundry and I don't realize like well, which well ah. I can't tell now. I like has that one been watched four times or nine? What's happening here? It's all falling apart. So then, what's the yeah. big idea? Like, what's so now you're trying to solve a problem of American manufacturing, right? Um, but well, something else. But that, but I mean, I think I think there's there's two things happening in tandem. So the one really like the the core uh, underlying thought is that. We really want to revive the American cut and sew industry through, I, I guess that's it. We want to re revive the American cut and sew industry, period. But I don't think you can do that by telling people that something is made in America and asking them to buy it on that basis. Mm. I think that's akin to charity. And and if you're doing that, then you know you can probably get somebody to buy something once but like, I don't know where that leads. And so what we have to do is make people's favorite products and back them up with a super high level of you know, service. It has to be their favorite experience. And even beyond that, we have to have found a reason to have done it here at all. Because mm -hmm. otherwise, one day we'll have investors and they'll go, it's great that you've, you know, you, you, you made us a million dollars this year. But now let's make it in Mexico, and we'll make two million dollars next year. Right. And like, and there, and there has to be a real answer and reason for not doing that. That's beyond just like, well, we, you know, we really want to make American jobs because that's not sustainable. So we're, so we're looking for the opportunity that is the reason to to do that. And I think, I think part of it then lives in the brand, which I love creating, which is a, a brand about kind of a can-do attitude and spirit yeah. and, uh, and, and a slightly uh, a different take on masculinity than what I had seen through most of my life, uh, which was very like sort of metrosexual, got really cool. And, and I think, uh, you know, what we're saying is that what makes you a man, it's not about how your body looks, you know, there's not like shirtless guys and they're chiseled and and it's not about uh you know what you have it's about like what you say and, and values it's about your values yeah. yeah um so so that's why and that and then that's why we launched the sweatshirt actually it was just because um i felt like the story that we could tell with the sweatshirt would really accelerate our storytelling with all of our products. So let's fill this in. So, yeah. so you start out with one product, which is started like with the underwear. men's underwear, yeah. right? And, and, and it has to be in high volume for this all to work. Like, like we're cranking the stuff out. Right. Yeah. So, and then you move on to a project which, as we're shooting this, you know, it, it'll have been done for a little while by the yeah. time this airs, but um, you have this this thing called the 10-year hoodie. Yeah, the 10-year hoodie. and and. And so I put it on Kickstarter again because uh, where we are as a company, we don't have a lot of resources to allocate to things that we don't know are going to work. Mm -hmm. um, and Kickstarter allows you to pre-sell a thing and in doing that really to get the funds to do the right. thing. So and we should probably say also the first one was, was also... The first one was on Kickstarter uh, and it kind of began with this premise. I, I was holding up pictures and I said, you know, I, I went to Macy's 
And of the 10 or so high-end brands they sell, not one is made in America. And I'm, I'm just showing the tags in the underwear, mm -hmm. uh, photos of them. So I went to another store and another, and you know, I, I wasn't saying that everything should be made here, and I wasn't saying that that the things that aren't made here aren't as good. Mm. I just said, shouldn't we be able to do this too? Mm. Like, isn't it weird that we can't, that nobody can? Uh, and I think people really connected with that idea, you know. Yeah. And and then and then I said, and like, and let's make it good. And because let's linger yeah. on this for a second, because there are a lot of people who are like, I have an idea for a physical product. Yeah. And, but I don't have any money to actually fund this, and I don't have I don't have access to loans. I don't have access to VC, um, so 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 I can't do it. And Kickstarter or crowdfunding platforms like it, yeah, are making stuff like this possible. Maybe for the first time ever. Yeah, it's really neat. I mean, the the thresholds to to entering uh, a lot of spaces have lowered, you know, to the place where I I think it's probably now easier than ever to stand in front of a crowd and say, here's the idea, mm. and and have their reaction help move it forward. Yeah. Um, you know, Henry Ford didn't get the luxury of going <laughs> like, and they're, and they're gonna be affordable. <laughs> like, you know, give me like $500, and in like a year, you're gonna have a car. It's gonna be great. Right. We're gonna do it by lining everybody up. Uh, but, but yeah. Yeah, and it's an amazing. Pl I, I'm, I'm, I'm loving seeing what that's doing to people's ability to just take ideas out of their head and make them realities without. Because you have so many more people now, from what I, I see, um, who have great ideas, and but are risk averse. Yeah. And essentially, like they can, they can prove demand, and they can, you know, pre get all the prepaid stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, so the same way then that. We were saying earlier, if you keep asking why, you'll get mm. down to because it makes me happy. Yeah. I think, you know, when you talk about risk adverse, if you keep asking like why not, mm. it it always boils down to like because I'm scared. Yeah. Because it's scary. It's scary to raise your hand and say this is what I want. Yeah. But if you can if you can take that plunge, if you can like just accept that risk, ignoring all of the other risk that will follow it. Just taking that risk of admitting to the world what it is that you want to do, uh, oftentimes the world will, you know, come to your rescue or sort of reshape around you to yeah. help with that vision. I mean, I think one of the interesting things, Kickstarter, I think, is fascinating because you, you can get a ton of data from it. You can fund and launch a company based on pre-selling your yeah. your idea. Um, but the one thing that it doesn't eliminate, which where people still have to be willing to be a little bit scared, is um, in fact, it may actually exacerbate it because you know, in, in before that, if you had an idea, you're trying to just show it to a whole bunch of people who you trust and like keep it private, keep it private, NDAs all over the place. And now with Kickstarter, it's like, okay, now I have an opportunity to actually not have to risk my money to potentially bring a product or a company to life, but I got to risk myself because well, right. I need the, to be very there's public. Always, there's always this. a risk in some way, right? Right. So, I mean. You're risking judgment on a much higher level, I think, yeah. and a much broader public and level. I think, like personally, I, I, you know, when we were talking about those career jumps, yeah, um, that's always been my process. Is that I, I've, I, I'll first tell people, like all of my friends, what it mm. is that I'm going to do, and then, I, I think, I end up actually just being beholden to the fact that I've said it. Mm. I've like said it enough right. times. Now you got to do it. Um, but I think it's something that I'm that I'm comfortable with. But that, you know, the more comfortable anybody can be with it, the more you can really shape your world. It's you I, know, it's that first moment. That yeah, agree. You know, and it's and it's. You know, I, I spend a lot of time thinking and writing about just this because I think fear of judgment, especially people talk about fear of failure, which is really just fear of loss combined with fear of judgment. But when you really think about it, the fear of loss is a much easier part to handle. Because we can pretty easily like you know create the recovery scenario, fear of judgment is what shuts so many people down because it's like I'm going to be ostracized from the tribe. Yeah, you know. And what's interesting is that Kickstarter handles the fear of loss part of it, but it actually escalates the fear of judgment part of it. Because if you if your campaign doesn't succeed, it's not you know you're not failing in private anymore. Right. Well, I wonder you know, and. 
By the way, the so a lot of people now write me asking for help on Kickstarter, and I, yeah. I I'll answer all of them as best as I can. I help everybody as best as I can. Um, I think the people though who do fail and who are most likely to fail are the people who put it up and then they kind of walk away from it mm. and expect that it'll do its thing. And and I I think that the reason why they do is because like you know that first step of well like let's email friends and family right that that should surely yeah. be the first. Is a step that's scary. Yeah. Um, but and then just back to that idea of like, well, it was this or or I don't eat. Yeah. I think it also in those moments, it's not just that it motivates you, but it it makes it easier to take those plunges. You know, it, it makes it easier to do a bold thing right. because you're just like, you know, I can't not do it. Right. I've <laughs> like I've been backed into a corner. I like, right. I'm gonna scream. That's how it happens. Um. But, uh, but so the sweatshirt felt like a, a moment where we could tell the story again from a different angle. Mm. And, and, the, and so the story, again, it, it played into the brand level and the product level. And so for the brand level, the story that we were telling is just that it feels like, uh, or, or I believe, that most of the world is busy outsourcing, offshoring, and just making things as cheaply and poorly as they possibly can for maximum profit. And at the end of that, they will tell you why you deserve nothing more. And mm. and your expectations as a consumer have just been lowered so far that you expect it. You, right. you buy something for cheaper, sort of falls apart or it isn't what you want, but like half the time you won't even return it because somewhere on the back of the receipt, it says that you can't. Mm-hmm. And like, eh, that's I guess that's what I get. Ha ha, yeah. jokes on me. Um, so that was sort of the brand proposition because I was saying, isn't it time again that that we do better? You know, my when my dad was young, if you bought something in a store and something was wrong with it, I don't even know that he would keep the receipt. He'd just go back to the store. The, the store had mm-hmm. a reputation. The store had a relationship with you. The store, you know, cared to do right by you. Nah. Um, and then on the on the product side, like I'm I'm saying about making things in America, then we have to find the value to doing that. And it has to be a, a real and authentic value. And so when we were talking about, you know, we'll we'll make a really great sweatshirt. Okay. Well how long I, I want the sweatshirt to last forever. My my favorite sweatshirts, I want them to last hmm. absolutely forever. Well what if it didn't what what is the value that we can provide in our in our office? We always say like, what wouldn't Ralph and Calvin do? That, that's what we talk about most days. But uh, it's that I could send it right back to the factory where it was made, and we could reconstruct any part of it that needs reconstructing mm. at any minute because it's right around the corner. Uh, and and so there's the value where you know where when you know one day years from now when the board of directors says, let's make it in China. Oh, but then we have to ship a thing 6,000 miles you uh, know, just to get it fixed, right. just to come back. We could never do it that way. So it also kind of sets up future defenses. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's just like it, it offers an authentic and real value to doing it here right. uh, that can't be done any other way than doing it here. If you want to mend it mm. you know, with, with the same people and, and equipment right. that made it, it it's got to... Yeah, so it's, it's a, it creates a whole different value proposition that's locally based. Yeah. It's really tied. So we called it the 10-year like hoodie because we've built it to last a lifetime, but we're promising that it's going to last at least 10 years. And if at any time uh, over that span it sort of rips, tears, comes apart at the seams, you're going to send it back to mm-hmm. us. We're going to mend it free of charge and send it back to you. And then even in looking at that, we it, it turns out, well, there are fun ways to mend a thing. Mm-hmm. And so maybe it'll kind of become like, Tattooed, it'll, it'll, it'll. Right. No, I love that character. Thing, like the, the little zigzag stitches and change your colors. Yeah. And, and so then, actually, a, about a week ago, somebody wrote in, and they said we had offered a patch as like a lower level. At a, at, a, at eighty nine dollars, you could buy a sweatshirt. Mm-hmm. But if you, you know, if you just wanted to support us in some way, for ten dollars, we'd send you a patch that says like Flint and Tinder indestructible. Uh, and he said, "Have you ever looked at the grills of an old Mercedes?" And, and you'll notice that they have all these badges on them. It, those badges actually represent like it, it lasted another year, it made it a million miles, it oh, crossed no a kidding. continent. And so, yeah, you take it back to the dealership uh-huh. who will sort of verify that this car has done this thing and then they'll give you this badge. 
Uh, and so he was like, wouldn't it be cool if the hoodie could do that too? So, oh, so now we've got a, a new thing that we're, we're going to like announce, I guess, in a day. We'll see if anybody cares. But where like, you know, this hoodie for every year that it lasts, we'll send you another patch. It'll have a thing or, mm-hmm. you know, there'll, there'll be some different milestones that, right. that we'll celebrate. That I, I think it'll just make it neater and feel more yours over time. Yeah, no, that's really cool. And I love the idea also. I mean, the way you frame that particular campaign, I like the concept behind it. I like, I love the fact that you're building a business that there's there's this bigger form of service to you know to. It's a double the bottom line. Yeah, we, we you know it, it's a new concept that, that I I feel like I hear about more and more, mm-hmm. and it, and it's really great because when I was young, uh, unbeknownst to me, I think uh, I have a father-in-law who's a, who was a CEO and then got out of the CEO game in manufacturing. And the reason why he got out of it was he said that something had changed and that uh, and that shareholders wanted their needs met above all else. Mm-hmm. Right. And they would reward you as management for that in really big ways. People were starting to get really big salaries, but it was at the expense of everybody else. Right. Uh, and that was the bottom line, right? Like, let's chase the bottom line and, yeah. and we'll get rich Maximize for shareholder value. I mean, public. Mac, right, that's exactly what it is. And that's for the public company. If you're a public company in the United States, your mandate legally yes. is maximize shareholder value. Yes, and, and, and so now I think what, what started to happen and what really excites me is there, there are new companies, there's even new structures for it that were not actually right. structured in this way, uh, but that have double bottom lines. Right. And so. Uh, written into our operating agreement is that there's two, there's two agendas. One is creating profit, mm. uh, you know, so that you're a, a legit for-profit company. Right. But the other is doing right by then our other shareholders, we call them, which are both customers and the people making the stuff. Right. So how do you? What are the metrics for that? For doing right by them? Um, well, it's not. So you don't have to, to to live in this way. You don't have to have metrics on the on the other bottom line so mm. much as you can then justify decisions mm. by saying well, oh, it was for that. Whereas right. in in the in the maximizing shareholder value right. that you just it's described, right? It's do- and and if you were to ignore something like, for example, if if Haynes wanted to buy Flint and Tinder and make it in China, and I stopped that deal, our shareholders would say, well, you've just breached your fiduciary responsibility to this company. You, right. you you broke the agreement. That's not okay. Uh, whereas, you know, in the system that I've described, I could point to our other bottom yeah. line and say, well, that's why. And they would go, oh, right, we did agree. Right. We did agree that there were two things going yeah. on. Uh, and so you haven't really, you know, done wrong by us. Yeah. You've made a decision. So the other, the other side really applies as sort of like a decision-making framework almost. Yeah. yeah. I, I think so. I mean, it's it's like uh, Google's, you know, don't be evil. Right. Which once you, <laughs> once you hit a certain scale, might be harder to achieve on any given day. But uh, So, um, and I guess maybe, maybe you're talking to this already, but I'm curious because I know you're friends with Tony Shea, who's, you know, built... A company on the back of providing extraordinary service. You know, he'll tell you he sells customer service, not shoes. Right. But also, you know, he's become this maven for happiness within his organization. Yes. Um, so, and and to me, I'm kind of I've, I've become a little bit obsessed with this. Also, I I kind of call it like a triple bottom line, which is you know like you're putting money in the bank for you and for your family. You know, you're serving the greater community. But you're also becoming a vehicle to help self-actualize the people within the organization. Yeah, Tony is like. I mean, I think the it, people people ask me like, what is that guy's core strength? Right. He, he has this partner, Fred, uh, and Fred will say that he's the world's best merchant. Mm. And I, I when I feel really brash, I go like, I'm the world's best marketer. <laughs> so they say, well, like, what what is Tony great at, right? And I think Tony is really great at creating systems, uh, you know, at, at at creating systems through recognizing patterns and mm. you know and actualizing them. Uh, it just so happens that the systems that he wants to create and that he likes creating are around happiness, mm-hmm. and and so you see it when you walk around. Zappos. I mean, they they really uh, 
when people talk about a culture, you know, he's created a corporate culture. It like, it almost, it uh, it negates what that actual experience means for each employee. Mm. But like, one of the things that they do, which I I think is the most amazing thing, is they have a team there, whose challenge or whose purpose. I wish I could remember what their title is and what their group is. But they they want to help you accomplish whatever it is you want to accomplish. And so you go to them and you say, here's what I want to do, whether it's buying a house or running a marathon or starting a company of my own. And for 30 days, they will work with you to help plot out that course and to help you, you know, take those steps. And, and at the end of that period, the whole company will celebrate your achieving that mm. oftentimes without even announcing what the that was. Right. Right. Like, you know, because it might be very personal. To you and might not yeah. be something that you want to announce to a group, but they 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 will just help and facilitate and celebrate your personal growth and right. your taking on that challenge yourself. And and you know that Tony enjoys making systems that allow for that and then sees how the value impacts in all different ways is is really amazing. So So is that something that you're I mean, I would imagine that that's important to you to try and build into what you're doing to the extent that you yeah, can. Yeah, we experiment. It's it's yeah. hard to know. Like we 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 were doing a thing work from home Wednesdays, mm. uh, where everybody would work from home on Wednesdays, and I really loved it because it made Thursday feel like Monday. We were, <laughs> we were just so like actionable again. Everybody would come in all pumped like, up. It's Monday. Yeah, but and the next uh, day, woohoo! It's Friday. <laughs> but it was a little unclear uh, what was actually going on on Wednesdays when we were all in our own corners. Right. We were all talking to each other. Uh, but you know we're 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 pursuing experiments like that because I, I think you know right now Flint and Tinder is a team of seven, mm -hmm. and in that moment is really when you can you know we can decide and make changes to what is the culture of our office yeah. and our team really quickly. You know I could decide that we're doing work from home Wednesdays and then say, I don't know, let's not do it for a month and see what that looks like mm -hmm. in a way where, you know, if everything goes well and you end up as 250, it's like... Make it harder. Yeah, like, what, what do you mean we're not going to come in on Wednesdays? Who's, like, there's just like all these different things. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it is, it is mm. it's a big part of what we work on. I think it's also, it's, you know, in, in startup world, talent, is hard to come by. It's mm. it's really yeah. hard to get people to believe in what you're talking about enough that they're willing to commit their time. Um, yeah. And so, uh, you know, those kind of things are things that can really help and, and we all experiment with them as a group, but the same way that we don't want to make stuff in America just because, we don't want to do these things just because they're like perks. They really have to, have to help. Right. Yeah. No, I love that. Um, Amazing journey. I've never done so much talk. This is like, this is the coming here and like maybe going to a therapist or I, I'm going to leave feeling thing. relieved. You yeah. just call your therapist and say, we're good for this week. Yeah, I got, I got this one. This one's covered. It's all good. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, which is a great place to kind of come full circle. So, you know, the name of this is Good Life Project. So, um, so if I offer that term to you to live a good life, what ideas come up? I don't, you know, it's funny. I... I, it's hard to remember to live a good life. And, and one of the things that I think about a lot, uh, it, so I, I went through a couple phases in between these different jobs, right? And, and during these times, something would happen, like someone would call, I moved to LA, I wanted to be a photographer, I'd get a call, literally one day somebody called me up and they said, you know, I want you to shoot all of my clients. You'll shoot Slash and Stephanie Seymour, and you know, we need everybody needs new pictures. And I, oh, this is amazing! It's going to be great. And then I never heard from that person again, and hadn't written their number down, right? And it was like, and and so at the end of day one, I called my mom. I was so excited, right? Like, oh, it's all happening. Uh, you know, a week later, I hadn't heard back, and I felt like I had lost something, you know, and and my emotions would swing that same way. And mm -hmm. she pointed out uh, one time that the net change was actually nothing. That between the day when I was so low, knowing that I wouldn't do that thing, and the day when I was so high, thinking that I would do that thing, nothing had actually changed beyond the way that I wanted to feel about my world around me. Um, and 
and so it's hard. You know, I, I walk into an office where I do a thing that I love, and I get to do it with a, a team that I really enjoy working with, and we have a mission beyond ourselves that I think is really fun. And yet, some days are really, really hard, uh, and I don't know, and I don't know why. And I have to remind myself that 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 the point is enjoying the ride. There's actually a sign uh, next to my desk that says it's supposed to be fun. And there's another one that says, if you're not doing it with joy in your heart today, why don't you not do it today? Um, and 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 it's just important to remind yourself. I like, yeah. So that's I, I think the good life project for me probably just means remembering it, just being aware mm-hmm. that, that 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 that's the point. Yeah, I love that. It's more about awareness. Do you love it? No, I do love it actually. <laughs> yeah. All right. No, I mean because I think it's something that you don't. It's like to focus on like that is the point but what so so what how would you give give me how 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 you answer that question typically ah so you're reversing the uh, <laughs> just to, to really bring it full circle <laughs> yeah um it's it's an evolving thing for me I, I what's interesting for me is i think i'm getting clearer on what it's not um and part of the the whole basis of this project is to try and explore um you know it's kind of my quest you know, I have ideas, and it's fascinating to me to see how other people bring into it. You know, one of the big awakenings is that it's not a place that you arrive at. Is that very similar to you? It's it's an awareness, it's a lens, it's something that you bring to, you know, every day when you open your eyes. Um, to me, fundamentally, too, it's, you know, I, I can tell you what I think big pieces of the puzzle are at this point. I think major pieces are um, gratitude, um, sense of service and giving and uh, valuing um, relationships over stuff, you know, relationships and experiences over stuff. It's huge. Yeah, Tony, and, and that's to, just a piece of it. To go back to Tony for a second. So I, I know I had invited you to Las Vegas, yeah. and I think you'd said you're already coming. No, I was actually supposed to go last week, but I had to cancel because oh. some other stuff. Well, you should come. We'll, we'll, we'll have to organize <laughs> that. But... When you go there, one of the things on the tour is you'd see his house. They take you through his apartment, mm-hmm. and you look out in all the different directions that he looks and at all the different things, and we say, you know, he's building this and he's doing that. But if you, if instead of looking out, you look around, uh, what you find is that there's not, like, rich guy stuff surrounding mm-hmm. you. It, it's, right. you know, it, and, and there's something to that. You know, like, you watch Cribs, and, like... I, like I don't know how happy those people always are. Uh-huh. It's a little hard to know. But you you had been talking before we turned the cameras on. Uh, you were talking about how you worked at the SEC, mm. um, which, in some ways, like you know, by my lens, I I can think of no less happy place, right? Than like <laughs> trying to find the criminal among a room of criminals in a right. financially like spreadsheety kind of like oh my god that must have been maddening and by their very definition they're trying to get around you they're trying not to be helpful uh, but but that too could have been the good life and happiness right for for somebody yeah you know it's and that's that's one of the reasons why um, you know when people ask me the question I'm I'm still very much exploring it and I also it's very obvious to me that whatever answer I give is is relevant and contextualized only for me right um, you know that's my overlay that's my experience and everybody's gonna have a very you know if I go to a kid who's you know living in a slum in Mumbai they're gonna have a very different answer you know if I go to Branson he's gonna have a different answer yeah if I go to so it's that's one of my fascinations with the question is how it changes with context so dramatically and with, with life situation um, and thus the project. Right. <laughs> Is good life so, because then just even hearing you talk, uh, like I, I've, I've said good life and happiness interchangeably. Yeah. But then when you I, mentioned the kid in Mumbai, they're not really. Right. I mean, there's, there's, so to me, there's, there's like I mean, a threshold. Which is really interesting because I think when I started this project, I, I thought of happiness as the major part of it. But increasingly, I think there's more. Um, and I think when you said, what are people fundamentally after, you know, happiness, I think it, that's a huge piece of it. But um, there's, there's bigger stuff, you know. Yeah. 
And that's part of what I'm sort of exploring. And one of the things that keeps floating in is increasingly with me is, um, is meaning. Um, you know, Viktor Frankl. And you, you talk about people who have endured horrendous suffering and found extraordinary meaning and purpose in their lives. And they, they ha they're doing hard things every day. And um, objectively, on the happiness scale, they're um, probably a lot less happy than some other people. But if you ask them, are you living a good life? You know, if they've devoted themselves to purpose, to service, and, they're, and they feel like they're really making a difference, that person is very likely going to say, you know, experience that, that life as being good. So there's, there's more pieces, and that's, um, yeah, again, mm. the project. <laughs> right. Uh, right. I guess the word a good life to me, now, like happiness, it, there, it's, like, it's like a fluctuating, it's like the needle on an equalizer. Mm. You know, are you happy right now or are you not happy? Right. Uh, but like a good life. Is a longer constant. Yeah, I think it's yeah, you know, it's the longer it's yeah, it's it's the longer smoother curve. Yeah. <laughs> the jags along the way, but you're looking at the trend, maybe. Right. But anyway. Um, I thank you so much for your time. Thank really, you. Really enjoyed the conversation. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, so I am I'm Jonathan Fields and uh, uh, my guest today has been Jake Bronstein, CEO and founder of Flint and Tinder, signing off for Good Life Project. Mm -hmm.